words are about to be spoken on the extreme life of Matt Hardy. We are broadcasting from the Blue Chew Studios. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code HARDY at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. I, of course, am John Alba, joined every single week here by the man of the hour, one half of the greatest tag team to ever walk the universe. Mr. Matt Hardy, how are you, my friend? We finally wrapped up Becoming Broken, and now we're moving on. We are. We're moving on. That was a, that was a lot of fun, though. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, I got so much positive and and really constructive feedback too. And I think uh, everyone that listened to it did. So uh, thank you guys so much for checking that out and tuning into the Becoming Broken series. How did it feel listening back to the episode and once again reliving that moment, walking down that aisle at WrestleMania? I, I mean, amazing. It's it's one of those moments that there. I feel like you're very lucky if you get a moment that every time you talk about it, it gives you goosebumps. Yeah. And that WrestleMania 33 return is truly one of those moments. I mean, every time it comes up, I just my mind goes back to that place and that vibe and just and the, it was just such a surreal scenario. And just to come out in front of that sea of humanity, they're chanting delete, delete, delete and going nuts. And, and you guys had established this other persona somewhere else and it crossed universes to go to WWE you know, at the showcase of the Immortals WrestleMania. So it was a truly a magnificent moment in our careers. I was just so glad that everyone picked up on the don't let them do anything fucking stupid story. That story <laughs> was all over the internet. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and very much encompassing of Jeff Hardy. So, I and- am I, I am my brother's handler. And everyone said your Vince impression was great, which I didn't know you had a Vince impression. Uh, it was kind of like just a, a half-assed Vince impression, too. It's cadence. That's what it's all <laughs> about. But we got a lot of great stories like that. If you go through our archives here on The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, some of my favorite stories with Michael Hayes. And there's so many more that you guys can go check out in the archive, wherever you get your podcast And dropping early, ad-free on adfreeshows.com. And Matt, if they want to help support the podcast, what can they do for us wherever they listen to them? They can give another one. Not a two, not a three, not a four, but a five-star review. Five-star review. Five fingers, five stars. Give us five stars on every single episode. And whatever you like in it, compliment us, damn it. We work (laughs) hard for you. (laughs) Send it to us at Matt Hardy Pod on Twitter. Screenshot. You'll be entered to win a little prize as Matt and I are going to be getting that stuff together shortly for you soon. Maybe you could hit the jackpot. Maybe you could. Well, Matt, we've got a very cool episode this week. It is WrestleMania 2000. This is pretty much the predecessor of the TLC match, as we would learn to love. And we have a special guest joining us on this week's podcast. Who are we going to be hearing from? We are going to be hearing from the one and only Christian Cage, my lifelong frenemy. We've either been best friends or we've been bitter enemies Uh, at every stage of the game. We have been frenemies, I guess. So Christian Cage, and I think he is one of the most underrated talents and minds to ever grace a pro wrestling ring. Uh, He's going to be joining us for a watch along of the WrestleMania 2000 Triangle Ladder Match. And I'm excited about that. Our first ever watch along here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. I'll give you guys all the time codes if you want to pull up your Peacock or we'll also have it in the video version as well. So that way we'll make sure that everybody, because, you know, you're getting all those royalties from Peacock. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone could... (laughs) Send those clicks and get you that extra side cash there. So oh, your sarcasm is top notch this morning. <laughs> so Matt, um, busy week for you. A tables match last week. Yeah, How you feeling? It was a little bit of a controversial tables match, but uh, you guys ended up coming away with the win. Hardy Boys standing tall at the end of yet another tables match. So once again, the reason there was a controversy behind this tables match was mainly because of social media. Uh, As I've said in the past, the best thing about social media is that it gives everyone a voice. The worst thing about social media is that it gives everyone a voice, you know, and sometimes there's just people that comment on things and and they just make things overly difficult. Uh, And I'll I'll take responsibility for it, even though technically I don't think it's my fault. I'll I'll take the heat, you know, because apparently we had spoke to the person who was like our producer and the people in the truck and they were down with the rules and they understood basically to win a tag team tables match in AAW, much like the Royal Rumble 2000 match. Both members of a team have to be put through tables in an offensive matter by members of the other team. And that's how you win the match. Apparently, we had given this to the powers that be, but it didn't get uh, 
transitioned over to the commentators. So they weren't totally crystal clear on it. It's not they, related to them. They, they were kind of making it up uh, on the fly as it went along. So I, I wish I would have just went and talked to Tony Schiavone, JR, and, and whoever else during the uh, day of and, and cleared it up. So so I'll take the heat for that. If you guys want to give someone the heat for it, you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at me. I like it. Everybody on the internet's mad at me anyway, so it's all good. Um, but I enjoyed the tables match and I thought it was, uh, I thought it was really good. I thought it was really strong. Uh, Butcher and Blade, I know they were both extremely nervous about this thing, uh, as ironic as, as that may seem. But uh, it, it was great to have that match with them, and I thought it was a good environment. There was so much carnage and destruction, and, and that's what we promised in that match, and I was so happy we got that. And I felt like it was a very fitting revenge after both Butcher and Blade turned to me and they, they beat me up viciously whenever they kicked me out of the own, my own group that I started myself, the HFO. They're talented tag team i like them a lot i got to work a little bit with them on the independent scene and they're just very unique very unique especially the freaking butcher what a look he has he's a real life rock star it's like very cool their package so i'm sure that was a cool experience for them to work with you guys and you know it's funny there was uh, a few people that asked me like on social media and i'll address it here uh actually john someone bought a cameo from me and they said oh i really loved what you said on the extreme life of Matt Hardy about the Briscoes, you know, like taking a stand for the Briscoes about how in society and humanity, we have to uh, learn how to forgive people, especially if they legitimately are trying to change their ways or legitimately have changed. And I thought that was cool. But then they also said in the same cameo, which they didn't even ask for a cameo. They just literally wanted to interact with me. And then they said, Hey, can you and your brother stop doing these table matches because they destroy your bodies. And at this stage of the game, you guys shouldn't be doing that. And I was like, Dude, I don't think you understand. Like, it's probably easier for myself and Jeff to take a couple big bumps through tables than to get out there and have a 20 minute match and take a uh, take 25 or 30 bumps, boom, 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 back to back, especially if they're big and intense bumps. You know, I would rather land flat on a table and go through it than actually land in a high angle bump, like on my neck or whatever. So th- there's a there's an image or a belief that like these table matches are much more destructive to your body, but it's uh, it's okay, guys. I promise we're going to be safe with every move that we make, or I will make sure, as my brother's keeper, that he is as safe as he can possibly be. Even though he is a little bit more of a stuntman than a wrestler, I am going to uh, do the best to ensure he has longevity in his career. You got to get a uh, Jeff's Keeper t-shirt going there just yeah. to make sure you get a little collar. That'll be good I stuff. <laughs> now, I was just going to say, too, even like with the, the few big bumps that we took um, – I, I thought I was going to be a lot more sore, especially when I did the elbow drop where I ran down the apron and bled yeah. and I crashed through the table. Like part of the table kind of jammed me in the back a little bit. My ribs were a little tight and I was like, oh man, there might be bruised. That might bother me for a couple of days. But I uh, took a hot bath uh, after the after the match and soaked for 20 or 30 minutes. And I got home and it was in my hot tub uh, a couple of times on the day. And then I was great. Like uh, 24 hours, 36 hours later, I felt 100%. I was no, good that's awesome. So it wasn't wasn't bad at all. We got to start calling that uh, Matt Hardy rules because you came up with the table match rules for the 2000 match, right? So I did, yeah, yeah, and 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 I think now too, it all it almost gives me something to do in the future mm-hmm. in a tag team match where I can like uh, have another one of these matches and and almost make a story out of the commentators not knowing it in the beginning. So mm-hmm. I, I think there's something there, something to roll with there. Yeah. Uh, the other big piece of news this week, Matt, Warner Media and Discovery merging together this has been the talk of the town and we did an episode on strictly business on ad free shows about this eric bischoff and i oh oh, okay you did all right you did we did a full hour on it because eric bischoff had plenty to say about this so go check that out on adfreeshows.com but um yeah it's interesting because unlike wcw warner does not own AEW. right AEW has this really nice tv deal with Warner right now. And when, you get these, when, and when they are extremely happy with AEW right now too. When you get these big media mergers, mm-hmm. uh, there is some concern layoffs, stuff change. What's the level of concern like for you guys right now, if any, and how do you feel about that situation? I mean, there's zero. Uh, I, I don't know of anyone that has been concerned about it. I haven't seen any kind of, any kind of worry or concern. Uh, I mean, it's just business as usual. And, I for the foreseeable future, I continue to see it business as usual, especially because the the Dynamite show is doing great. It's in top three, top five every single week. You know, it's a it's a live program, which people love and they're really behind. And you have to always remember, too, it's only you know three years old. 
which is uh, quite a statement that's already in the top three to top five every single week. Yeah, that's what Eric and I talked about too. It, it's consistently in the top five for right. live TV, which is awesome. It's competing with sporting events, traditional sporting events. Yes. So uh, that's all good stuff there. And you know what? Discovery made its money on these programs that kind of lend themselves to be similar to what an AEW Dynamite is in that unscripted, it's scripted, but you know what I mean, like yeah. presentation. And I think it lends itself well. So hopefully all good stuff there. Uh, Papa Khan cashed in big on that TV deal at the beginning of 2020. So yeah, we'll see what is to come. I also think, uh, I think, I think Papa Khan is going to have a, uh, another big TV deal whenever this runs up as well, you know, because the product has just been delivering so damn well. And WWE doing well with its TV deals also drives the market up in that yes, regard too. It does. I mean, pro, pro wrestling it, it has, has proven, especially the last few years, that it is truly something that people will uh, th they will search out and they will find it and they will they will watch it and they will also like stick through the commercials the majority of the times too, which is is crazy. They're they're really loyal. Pro wrestling fans are very very loyal, and uh, it's a great place for advertisers to go to to get eyes on the product. Well, and as Jim Ross says, we'll keep with it picture in picture. That's my favorite thing that AEW does. Yeah. Love me some picture in picture wrestling. So. Good stuff there, Matt Hardy. You've got a busy week this week as well, but we are talking WrestleMania 2000 leading up to the triangle ladder match here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. So it's Friday. You know what that means. Hit us with that Matt fact. Matt fact. Matt's match at WrestleMania 2000 stole the show. Yeah. It did steal the show. It sold the show. It did a lot of things because, quite frankly, it's a pretty shitty WrestleMania. And thankfully, we have this match on it. And we'll talk about that. Is it, when, when is the last time you watched this whole WrestleMania, John? About a year and a half ago. I really? watched this whole WrestleMania. Uh, I was just doing some innocuous things around the house, and I threw it on the TV. And holy Jesus, it is a bad wrestling show. Really, it's so, it, it's so crazy too that you know that it's not perceived as a good wrestling show. I, I don't really remember the card in general. I remember the match that was after us, which was the main event was after us, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? No, it wasn't. It was not. You were followed by a cat fight between Terry and the cat. Oh, that was that was the bumper. That was like the buffer, and then the main event. Uh, let's see. I can't, I didn't. didn't we, see we, we were, we were, we were late in the show. I, the only thing I really remember after us was, was the main event because I think we were probably worried about like what our competition was. No, you, be. you actually, you were fourth on the night and there were nine matches on the show. Oh my God. Oh, then I, I am way off. Uh, <laughs> there, there you go. Once again, you can tell I've been in a lot of triangle ladder matches now. Yes. Um, well, I, I, meshed together. I, I feel like I, I remembered it was later in the show. And, and the reason being, I remember. Bruce Pritchard, who was running Gorilla and doing the times and timing out the show there. I remember he told all six of us, he said, guys, time is not an issue. Don't worry about time. I know you guys are going to do a whole bunch of crazy shit. Uh, take your time. If you need an extra four or five minutes, it's fine. Just don't rush it. Take your time. I know you guys are doing a lot of shit and there's a lot of setup involved in it. So don't rush. And we're like, whoa, that was really cool. And, and looking back at it now, 22 years later, like WrestleMania, like, I mean, <laughs> 15 or 20 seconds. I mean, that's just, that's like, it's worth gold to get that on WrestleMania. And they're telling us like, oh, don't worry about it. I know you're doing a lot of stuff. Take your time. Go out there. If you need an extra five minutes, you know, where things are like, you know, marked down to the seconds in this day and age. If you get, you know, 10 or 15 minutes in WrestleMania, it's incredible. But they're telling us like, oh, if you go 25, fine, 30, fine, whatever. It's like, oh my God. And we're all rookies. This was like our first WrestleMania on the main card for all of us. So it was a, it was a wild scenario. That's why I, I feel like it was a lot deeper in the show because they had plenty of time on the show. It's so funny that that was earlier and they told us that even, you know, like they weren't worried about time. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. First match of the night was a tag team match between Bossman, Buchanan, the Godfather and D'Lo. That went nine minutes. Then they had a 15 minute hardcore battle royal, which was one of the worst WrestleMania matches ever. And they fucked up <laughs> the finish for then. TNA beat head cheese in seven minutes. So the night is flying pretty quickly at that point. So they gave you guys some good time. Maybe, maybe they were just making up time. So that's why they give us extra. Yeah. But, so. but the reason I'm saying also too, it, it's, it's so strange that it was such a terrible WrestleMania. It's just because business was so hot at that time, which you would think that translates 
to like a really great product, which would translate in turn to a great WrestleMania. But, you know, apparently since you watched it a year and a half ago, I, I haven't, I haven't watched it in uh, since it happened. I don't think so. Oh, I'd probably put this in my bottom five WrestleManias overall. Okay, so, so, that, so that, that's wild that it doesn't, you know, correlate with yeah. the way business was so hot and, and so beloved at that time. Well, we'll talk about this with Christian too in a little bit, but there are no traditional singles matches on that WrestleMania. Terry mm. versus the cat is the only singles match and it's a cat fight. So that takes away a lot from the right. grandiose of WrestleMania. Right. And even in an era now where there's so many talent that you want to try to get on the card, they still make sure that there are a decent amount of singles matches. And it's not just every match is a multi-man match. Yeah. I, you know, one thing I do remember, you know, the, the internet was just starting to come into, uh, you know, to the forefront at that time. I, I do remember there were people complaining that the main event was not a singles match. I, I do I do remember some people were a little upset it was a, a, a four corners match or whatever, right? It was a, a McMahon in every corner. Yes. And then and then Mick Foley, The Rock, Big Triple Show, H and Big Show. Triple H, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So and... I, I, I do I do remember there being a little bit of blowback to the main event not being a standard like one on one, give us a match between two main eventers that we want or whatever. but And like, even so, listen, those are four outstanding talent to have in a fatal four way, but the story of the match was about the McMahons. It wasn't about any of the four guys. So it didn't, <laughs> I like that face there that you gave. <laughs> Somebody make a gift. Matt Hardy brand on YouTube guys. <laughs> uh, that, that, that alone was worth, watching this episode so uh yes so it was interesting let's let's turn back a little bit here so as a reminder the last time that we visited this feud uh was at no way out 2000 edgy christian pinned you guys to earn the number one contender spot to become right. to face the newly crowned tag champs the damn dudleys terry had distracted you guys then the apa attacked you so right. that set up a match with the acolytes the next night and i want to throw this out there because this is just insane and you mentioned how hot business was well let's put in perspective here raw nearly tripled nitro head to head for the first time ever that next night ending mm. with 6.50 rating and a 9.9 .9 share while nitro ended with a new record low with over the past few years to that point of a 2.57 rating and a 3.7 share your guys' match against the Acolytes did one of the strongest numbers of the night with a 6.70. How are you and Jeff feeling about how you're positioned here? Because if I'm reading into that correctly, you guys, you're an attraction. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't even aware of like ratings or quarter hours or segments at that point, I'll be honest. But, you know, the one thing I can say looking back, if I was, I would love to say, you know, Competitions in the mud. I love to see it. I did that. I trolled people <laughs> with that for the longest time when I first turned hill as Big Money Matt. That clip that I, that I specifically just wanted to do in the uh, in, in the uh, elite deletion with Sammy, so I could use that whenever I trolled people after I became a hill, <laughs> where I had Sammy in the mud. So yeah, I mean that that's cool, and I do know that we were one of the hot young acts because I knew our merchandise was doing so well. I, I know in the year two thousand we sold more merchandise than any other tag team in history over the course of that year. And like we were breaking records at every level, which is very, very cool. You know, and that was us and in, in our prime or at our height, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say. But like, uh, as far as the TV ratings, that, that's before that was like really came to like the forefront or like was a, a huge standard. That, that was something, I guess they, they talked about more business as opposed to like talent in the locker room as they do today. It's much more of a, of a common conversation because now it's something that, you know, fans, have picked up on and they follow it as well. So now it's like a, a topic that is debated quite often in, in pro wrestling in general. And you guys were so far ahead of Nitro at this point that it's it's not even competition anymore. I, I, I do know that we had put the accelerator to the floor and we were blowing Nitro away. You know, where where the gap I, I do know that there was a feeling in the locker room where the gap was so far away, guys were worried that we were getting so far away that it was ultimately going to be bad for business mm. because they wanted competition to stick around. You know, because I, I do remember when we were there in 98, I feel like guys got treated a lot better. Uh, they they were a lot more lenient if people wanted to negotiate deals or get better money because there was someplace else you could go and, and make big money besides a, a WWE 
you know, obviously WCW was there and they, they had, uh, you know, they had deep pockets as well. So I, I know the further down the road we got, and w- once we start pulling more ahead of WCW, a lot of guys really were worried that if WCW does end up going out of business, it's going to be bad for business in the big scheme of things because it's going to take away a lot of leverage from, you know, the pro wrestlers who are uh, classified as independent contractors. And keep in mind at the time, too, the XFL is just starting to get off the ground. So Vince is putting a lot of money into that. You mentioned a few episodes ago that you felt like your paychecks were starting to see some yeah. of those losses as a result of that. Uh, WWF New York, which is a huge money loss for the company, just opens around this time, too. So it is a really interesting time. But simultaneously, Matt, that match that I just mentioned, it's at Madison Square Garden, another show at MSG for WWE. Mm -hmm. You guys sell it out. So that's just what happens. That's business at that point. I I remember where anything less than a sellout and turning thousands of people away at MSG was a disappointment. (laughs) You know, that's how business was then. And we would do, when we first started on the road in 1998, we would do 10 days on, and then four days off, 10 days on, four days off. And no matter what day of the week it was, if it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it was sold out every single night. And not just sold out like four or 5,000 people sold out. It was sold out 18,000, 20,000, 25,000 people every single night. So we're going to talk on this episode about how all three of these teams are losing matches leading up to WrestleMania. That's going to be a reoccurring theme here, and I'd like to delve into that. Edge and Christian lose that night to the New Age Outlaws, and that's X-Pac filling in for Billy Gunn, because if you remember, we talked about it on our No Way Out episode. Uh, Billy Gunn had gotten hurt, and they kept that match with the Dudley Boys super short. So now Edge and Christian, the new number one contenders, lose to the New Age Outlaws. So just keep that in the back of your head, okay? Also going on around this time, WWE gives notice to the USA Network that it's not going to be renewing its TV contract. (sighs) Raw was a staple on USA at that point. What kind of chatter is there in the locker room about that? Because this is the first time that we see WWE trying to really cash in on a big new TV deal. On TV rights, right? This was, I feel like this is probably... This was the beginning of the big TV rights battle, right? You know, because they'd been with USA since the start. And they, they had obviously had feelers out there, like in, in different places, in different markets. And, and I knew once we left USA, they were getting a, a huge pay bump, you know, so it was going to be more money going around. And I think as talent, we all hope that would translate to more money for us. Uh, not that it necessarily did. I mean, the XFL and all the other projects going on, but, you know, WWE, they were kind of, you know, they, they were kind of setting their ways and they had it down to a pretty decent formula then about what they were, what they were going to give guys and fill in. They would obviously end up going to TNN. The national yes. network and that would lead to spike tv and we rebranded spike i was doing my research and there's also something cool that happened on this week christian york and joey matthews your omega brethren are heading to ecw what do you think mm-hmm. of that opportunity for them yeah I, I i remember i was very happy that they got that gig and i want to say had they already been in the developmental system with wb because they were- came after that I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, that's what it was then. Uh, I was very happy that they got that gig, and I said, you know, I said, go there, uh, achieve as much as you possibly can, and try and build up a name for yourself, and then I'll, I'll do what I can do to try and get you in here at WWE. And, and eventually, we did at a developmental level. That's cool that you were looking out for them, too. So, try to. I would try and take care of all the Omega guys. Next week on Raw in Springfield. This is insane. Steve Blackman pins Matt Hardy in four minutes and 44 seconds with a front kick off the top rope uh, in the observer it is referred to as deathly quiet and not good. Mm. Steve Blackman was always very challenging to work with. Always, always very challenging, especially, you know, coming off all the matches we were having with edge Christian and the Dudleys and whatnot, you know, just once again, I almost compare that to, you know, the, the young guys, now in uh aw you know they can work with me I, I still get the style and i can still do my part to pull my weight i feel like we represented that young guy then that had this high work rate and could do all the you know all the crazy stuff and all, all the cool spots and take big bumps whatever but i don't think people like steve blackman for instance i don't think he was a guy that really meshed well mm-hmm. with a guy like me or with jeff or you know an edge or christian whatever it made it a lot tougher to have a real a real great match because we were so very different and had different styles in the ring. Also that night, 
Dean Malenko and Perry Saturn beat Edge and Christian. And that's via distraction from Terry. <sighs> so that's two losses now for Edge and Christian since they beat you guys to become the number one contenders. I mean, I really even looking back at this and and thinking about it now, I mean, I think Vince thought because of that tag team ladder match we had where we really got over huge, you know, the Hardys versus Edge and Christian, and then the tables match with the Hardys versus the Dudley boys, I, he just felt like we were Teflon. Like we didn't need these wins. People were going to cheer for us regardless of what we're doing just because of our performances. And I would, I would guess that was his mindset at that time. How do you feel as a worker, though, about that? Because it's frustrating. Yeah, you, it has to. You, you have to be concerned about your credibility as a talent. Of course, I mean, uh, you know, and it, that was one of those things too, uh, where you know they, they just say, "Trust us, trust us, let it play out." That, I know that's a famous statement now on the internet. You know, let it play oh, out. You know, trust us, let it play out. We got to play. You know, and, and it's just one of those things. It, it would become very frustrating, especially when you know you get to go out and you get to do you. And you make this magic happen, you're getting these insane crowd reactions, and then you kind of get, you know, reeled back. And then, then you you get very frustrated, you know, especially if they don't portray you in the way you feel like the you get very frustrated if they don't portray you in the in the way the crowd wants to see you portrayed as. And that, that's where the tide was starting to turn a little bit, and people were really starting to understand the business because in the Attitude Era, we kind of like gave everyone a peek behind the curtain, and now the internet is starting to come into prevalence and whatnot. So they're starting to read stuff, and they're starting to pick up more on like, uh, you know, dirt sheets slash you know internet wrestling sites and whatnot. So so they're learning a lot more about the behind the scenes stuff. So I'm sure that that makes them question like, well, why are these guys getting beat all the time? <laughs> why are these guys getting beat all the time? They're they're really over. You know, but it, it it was what it was, and we were all young guys, and we were just going to go out and do our job to the best of our ability and make the most out of every scenario we had. I would love to know your thoughts on the let it play out mentality because I, I look at it in two ways. In some situations, a company or a booking committee or whatever, writers have <laughs> built up good faith that you know that they will pay something off. And then in other situations, I feel like let it play out is used as a way just to give an excuse for something happening when there's no actual end game in sight. And, and to let it slide. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like with WWE now, I mean, if you hear that expression of like let it play out, they've kind of they've kind of burnt their trust, you know, with their consumers, you know, with, with their fans. I, I just don't think people trust them anymore because there's been so many times that people were – very uh, patient, and they waited for it to play out, but it just never did. So I think just kind of to trust with wrestling fans when it comes to that. Because long form storytelling, when you do pay something off down the line, as we just covered with this broken story, which was a quite literally a two year payoff, right. <laughs> like it's so rewarding as a fan. It's great because as I've brought up to you on this podcast, when you get rewarded for paying attention, there's like no better feeling. No better feeling. And, and, and I feel like that's when you become ultimately invested yeah. in whatever you're watching. So it's just, I hear it all the time online, let it all play out. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's became like a meme now, right? It's, yeah. you know, just people say it, you know, when they know it's going to be bad, you know, oh, don't worry, just <laughs> let it play out. <laughs> it really does become a meme. Were you ever told that by anybody in management to just let it all play out? You know, <laughs> I haven't. I mean, I, I've been, I've probably been told, well, I mean, trust me, we, you know, think about the big picture. You know, we, we got a big story here. This is just one small piece of the puzzle. You know, I've never heard that uh, exact phrase. Sure. No but one has tried to sell me on that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Now, around this time, you guys are running triple threat tag matches on house shows against the Dudleys. What do you remember about those matches and how did that help you guys establish some chemistry together? Yeah, us, the Dudleys, and e and C. Is that, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. I, I remember we enjoyed the matches. They, they were good, and and we all thought they were easy, and we were very happy with, you know, the content we would ultimately deliver at the end of those because we were just guys who were on the same page. We all had the same mindset, and we were all just so like-minded. It, it ended up being really, really good, uh, entertaining work. Also in the span, both Jeff and Christian are getting matches with S.A. Rios, and he's packaged with Lita at the time. These are heralded matches. Everyone is really mystified by what by what S.A. Rios can do in the ring and obviously giving him dancing partners like Jeff and Christian. That's awesome. Why do you think S.A. never became more in WWE? 
Um, he was great, man. I mean, probably just uh, attitude, mentality. Yeah. You know, it just. It, I, I feel like back then you kind of had to half-ass be a politician to mm-hmm. like stay in a, a good spot and continue to move up the card. And, and, you know, I, I was the one that always handled business for Jeff. I mean, I still do. Jeff would just go out and be a rock star. That's, that's always been our gig. You know, I'm the architect. I'm the one that, you know, handles politics and business and I make sure we're going in the correct direction that we need to be going in. And he just goes out there and he does his rock star gig. That, that's kind of our relationship. And, and I feel like you, 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 you learn that as time goes on, obviously for Bub and Devon, it was Bubba. He was the guy always heading up kind of the, the uh, direction of the team. And then Edge and Christian, they were both guys who could do it on their own, you know, so they, they would definitely be on top of it as well. So with SA Rios, he, he, he's probably just a guy that came there and, and performed and he was good and he had all this potential, but, you know, if he never pushed, you know, uh, or if he never tried to open any doors, you know, unwillingly, if he just came there to do his job, he, he was probably limited because he just didn't have the, you know, uh, the, the gritty political vibe to push himself forwards and, and get into a better spot. On March 12th, pretty big win for you on Heat. You beat Viscera one-on-one. Viscera. How about that? What a weird, of, of you know, like get beat by Steve Blackman, but then beat Viscera. What a weird scenario. You had some help from Jeff, but still. Yeah. What did we beat him with? Do you have that info in front of I you? I don't remember the exact finish of the match, but you, it, Jeff helped distract you to, to help distract him for you to get the win. There you um, go. Okay. You got to win over the big man, brother. On Sunday Build Night Heat. So, on Sunday Night Heat. So that's a big one. I always heard that he was a really cool guy and a, a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, so. he was. He, he was a good dude. So he was. Uh, he, he was. He was real cool. Uh, him and Mo, they actually came up and did a lot of indies in the Carolinas before we did. Oh. And and later on, when there were men on a mission, right? You know, Mo, Mabel, and Oscar. Uh, there was one point where Mo came out and did uh, an Omega show with us. You know, once he like wasn't doing a full time gig at, at WWE, and he kind of gave back to it a little bit and hooked us up with the deal and came out and did that show, which I, I, we thought was really cool because we'd booked a guy that had legitimately been on WWE TV before. And unlike Manny Fernandez, we actually really booked him and he really showed up and we really paid him <laughs> because he was legit booked. Fucking La Quintas, man. It's just crazy. Hi, Manny. <laughs> We got to get Manny on the show at some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, next night in Jersey, another sellout at the Meadowlands, man. You guys are crushing it there. You beat Al Snow and Steve Blackman. Uh, another match that it just seems like chemistry wasn't off per the reports. But then later that night, the Acolytes beat Edge and Christian with help from Midian. This is, dude, none of this makes any sense to me. I understand what you just said, what Vince is telling you, but they're the number one contenders. John, let it play out. <laughs> We're going to get to WrestleMania. I swear. By the way, I, I, I wanted to jump in here too. Uh, yes. we, had, uh, we had one of our amazing folk here, Dom, doing a little research real quick, and he just said that that Viscera match was the ref was checking on me and Jeff delivered the swanton, and that's oh. how I it. So once again, you know, there it is. Those dastardly Hardy boys have to cheat to win. So they're a little piece of shit baby faces. That's like your ver- right, right, exactly. Like that's like your version of twin magic almost. Uh, <laughs> doing something like that. Wow. Right. But I want to know how did you get Viscera down in the first place for Jeff to hit him with this? I'm not going to go back and watch Matt Hardy. I, 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 I would, I would guess he came in and missed the splash on me and took himself down. Mm. That would be my guess. Okay. I have no idea if that's accurate. I don't remember this match at all. I have zero recollection of it. And uh, that that would be my guess is that he's. Beat me up so bad, he goes for a splash. I move, and he's selling down, and the ref just checks on me, and Jeff does this one time. We can rewrite history and say that you slammed him like Andre at WrestleMania <laughs> three, if you'd like. Okay, I don't sure. think anybody's going to go back and find it. So. I, 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 I think also, too, all of this goes back, even like Steve Blackman being a bigger, jacked-up guy who worked uh, a more basic, earlier 80s style or whatever, you know, being a, a – Kung Fu karate assassin mm-hmm. or whatever. I feel like, uh, oh my God, Dom just told me so I nailed it. That's that's what wow. happened. There you so, go. There you have it. I mean, that, that that that's just my guess. But like once again, Vince always protected his big guys. You yeah. know, because we were like this. The we were smaller guys. We were the new breed, and and maybe he knew this is where it was going. But Vince's mentality is like these big guys had to be protected always. So I'm sure that's why that happened with Viscera, 
And uh, even with Steve Blackman, too, I worry. I, I know I'm sure he said, well, you know, this little guy who does all this flippy shit and does all these high spots and stuff. Steve Blackman, who's like a legit assassin, and he is like a legit badass, says if he beats him, it's no big deal. You know, I, I don't even think Vince would think about, you know, the context of a wrestling match or how good it was or how entertaining it was then. I, I don't even think that really was like a, a priority in the back of his mind. I think he was just looking for two guys in the ring trying to build up some sort of story for a fight. And then, you know, the guy who looks the most physically intimidating or the biggest is the guy who most likely should win. I, I feel like that was his mentality in that day and age. I personally liked my finish better, but we can go with that one too. So, I mean, I, I did. <laughs> Not only did I slam him, I press slammed him. So, like a warrior, and I repped him 17 <laughs> times. So let's keep going here because uh, we got to get moving. But uh, the reason I bring up this show, we spent way more time talking about this than I anticipated we would. Um, the reason I talk about this Raw show is because this is the night that's known for Bubba Ray more or less killing Mae Young. Um, he ends up power bombing her off the stage through some tables, and right. it's like an iconic Dudley Boys moment. Yeah. What do you remember about that? Uh, I mean, that was the start of a big thing. That's when he started doing the trance too, right? I remember that that got that got over huge, almost to the point it was so dangerous that he was a hill that just people wanted to see that because people were so bloodthirsty, and they loved seeing women get put through tables at that time. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I do remember well, and I remember May coming in the back and she was like, hell yeah, that's the way to go. I mean, she was like fired. She was fired the fuck up and she was excited about it. She was fine. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, Bubba took real good care of her and uh, they, 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 it looked great and they did it. And it started that whole trend of him going into the, uh, you know, going into the stair, being in the trance and powerbombing women through tables, which got over huge. Almost getting over so huge, it was like a babyface thing. He has told this story, and I believe I'm quoting verbatim here, but May told him to not be a, quote, fucking pussy. And yes, yeah, that, that, through no, that's day. true. Yeah, so. that is true. She was very foul-mouthed anyway, you know. Right? Like, she was she was, a, she was, a dirty old lady, bless her heart. But she was very foul-mouthed, you know. And, and that is what she told him. You're right. She said, look, she said, just because I'm an old lady, don't be a fucking pussy boy. <laughs> Legit. As you said on our Rumble 2000 episode in the archive, she was a filthy, disgusting woman, and everyone loved her for it. So good stuff there. So finally, here we are, like two and a half weeks out from WrestleMania. We're getting some integration between all you guys on SmackDown. The Dudleys beat Edge and Christian. They were the number one contenders after rep bump. Terry got involved. You guys come out, throw Terry into the ring, and Edge spears her. So we're all on the same page for our mutual hatred of Terry at this point. Version one together. There you go. V1 finally together. Exactly. In Chicago the next week, we get a tag team tournament throughout the show to qualify teams for a battle royal later in the night where the winner of the battle royal will go on to face the Dudleys at WrestleMania. Uh, unique concept. A lot going on there. That means a lot of short matches. But you guys beat X-Pac and Road Dog. Oh, my God. And speaking of this, mm -hmm. this is in Chicago. This is the loudest crowd I've ever been in front of. So, actually, the newsletter noticed uh, or said that this is one of the <laughs> wildest Chicago crowds they've ever seen for a wrestling show. I, I, myself and Road Dog at one point, we're in the ring, and he was saying something, like, almost like calling, you know, wanting to slow down the cadence of the way we locked up because the crowd was so hot or whatever it was, and the crowd was chanting so loud. I remember saying, like, I can't hear you. He was saying stuff and it was literally like it was muted. Wow. Because the crowd was so loud. I said, I, I can't hear you. And I had to lock up with him and get close so I could actually hear what he was saying. It was so loud. He was a few feet in front of me and he said something, called something, whatever. And I, I said, I cannot hear you, Brian. I, I can't hear you. I just remember that was the most enthusiastic, loud, insane crowd I can ever remember being part of. It, it was insane. It was yeah, an episode of Raw. Just a yeah. standard episode of Raw. And they always were historically, especially like when it was the Rosemont Arena back then. Uh, I mean, that that would be the loudest crowd on the whole loop. And I, I vividly remember that match so very well because it was so loud and people were just so overly enthusiastic. It was just mind-blowing. You should go check out Road Dogs Oh You Didn't Know Pod as well. That's just getting off the ground now, and you can find that on Ad Free Show as well. He's a great storyteller, so I think that's Oh, he's the best. Oh, you cool. didn't know? Oh, you didn't know? 
I'll never forget, man. I got to say this with Road Dog. There was a time where myself and Jeff wrestled him and Billy in a cage, and he kept talking about how he would jump on the trampoline. Like uh, Jeff and I would jump on the trampoline when we were young. He said, "Man, I was on the trampoline, man. I can do a backflip. I can do a backflip." He said, "I'm just, I'd be scared to do it, man. On you know, in the ring because I think I'd break my neck if I jumped off the ropes or whatever." He said, "Dude, we're in a cage." I said, you, you can hold on to the cage. I said, you should do a backflip. And we talked him into doing a moonsault where Jeff and I shot him. He ran up the ropes and did a moonsault to both of us. He said, man, I, I shouldn't do that. I said, no, do it. You can do a backflip on a trampoline. You keep bragging to us about it. that You're part of the TWF too. You you learned this high spot on the trampoline. We learn our stuff on the trampoline. So you, we want you to do it. And we finally talked him into doing it. It's probably the only time he's ever done a moonsault in his existence. He runs and he jumps up. And comes off the top and moonsault body blocks on a Jeff and I. We spot him like a million bucks. And he almost lands back on his feet. But the excitement in his face whenever he lands and he's safe. And he starts doing a suck it as hard as he possibly can. He was like so excited like a little kid. He, like, You know, he really, he did a moonsault. And we spotted him and he was safe and he didn't break his neck. That's and that's awesome. one of my favorite road dog stories ever. That's Sorry, awesome. that's a tangent, but I had to share it. No, that's great. That's a great story. That's why we appreciate you here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. Uh, so Edge and Christian beat the APA. That sets all of you guys up in the Battle Royal. It's you guys, two cool head cheese. And it comes down to you guys. I like the stakes here, but the Dudleys who are on commentary interfere and they powerbomb Jeff through Christian on a table, which gets us the official announcement that it will be a three-way ladder match, a triangle ladder match. Uh, I, 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 I remember that now that you say that. I, I recall that. I like the way that's laid out. I think that's unique. And for once, we're actually protecting you guys rather than having everyone lose here. So, uh, And it, it plays into what the Dudleys are doing, right? They're psychos and getting involved. I yeah, no, I mean, that, that, I, that is great storytelling. I feel like that that works perfectly. So, yeah. So now it's just pretty much all about uh, building heat with you guys. And what better way to build heat than you guys losing to Kai and Ty? Because <laughs> that's what happens on SmackDown. Um, well, there you go. Edge and Christian did help Kai and Ty win. So later in the night, Jericho and Taz are facing Edge and Christian, and you guys help Jericho and Taz win. So we're just getting in there. And meanwhile, that same night, The Rock faces Bubba Ray Dudley one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Is Bubba's over at this point? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was the reaction backstage to the Dudleys at this time? Were people recognizing how over they were getting? uh pe people people were happy with them uh they they were uh appreciative of their work and and i think they had really earned their spot like in the locker room and also on the roster yeah they, they were they were successful and I, I know the bubba thing putting chicks through tables was over huge and they any anytime vince has a concept of something different or strange that's never been done that the people really really react to he's always excited for it so so that yeah they, they were over people were into them for sure so then on the final Raw leading up to WrestleMania, Perry Saturn and Malenko. well, guess what they do, Matt Hardy? They beat the Hardy boys. Edge and Christian helped them do that. And then on SmackDown, Road Dogg and X-Pac, guess what they do? They, they beat Edge and Christian. Christian. How so, do you know? So, <laughs> even I, 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 I can't even remember. I don't even recall that we did that, you know, multiple times. Apparently, we like screwed each other. The, the fact that there was like this personal vendetta, kind of like a personal rivalry between the, the Hardys and Edge and Christian, I can kind of I can kind of get behind that. And uh, I, I feel like that sounds very repetitive uh, from you just, you know, putting it on me like that. I would have done it in different ways. I would have found interesting ways to maybe like even have it backfire or something that last week. Exactly. You know, I, I feel like you could have had, you know, especially if we had the week before where Edge and Christian screwed us, we screwed Edge and Christian. Maybe the next week, we both try and screw the other team it and it doesn't it work. Exactly. And we still overcome the odds or whatever. I, that's what I would have done, you know, but what do I know? I'm just a chump in this business. Um, but just to, to kind of break the repetitive repetitiveness of it. And then I also, I, I think it was good that we kind of portrayed this gig, like something is going to break between edge and Christian and the Hardys, because I, I do think turning edge and Christian Hill you know, following this match was the right move. Yeah. Because those, those guys were really geared to become Hills, and and it was the direction they needed to go to go to the next stage of the game, next level of uh, their career. And, like, one thing I understand about it is those other teams that we mentioned for the most part, except for Kai and Ty, but the other teams, like, they also have WrestleMania matches. They're going to be on the card. I understand you got to give them some wins, too. But you guys are the ones fighting for the championships. So having all of these teams that are in the championship match lose by hook or by crook. I don't really care. 
it feels like it's devaluing your importance leading into this match and that WWE is just banking on you guys going out and having a car crash match at WrestleMania that everybody's going to forget about all the stuff leading up to it. Yeah, and I just I, I, I just really think Vince never saw tag teams as, you know, like a main event draw. He just he just didn't. The tag teams were disposable. You know, I mean, he, he knew we were killing it as far as like doing merch and, uh, you know, the royalties we were making were like out of this world and we were moving merchandise, but I still think he kind of felt like we were all Teflon and yep. it didn't, it didn't hurt us to get beat. You know, even though I feel like to maintain credibility, you do need to pick up wins, you know, especially in key situations. Um, but, but just tag team wrestling has never been Vince's thing. You know, Vince is looking always for the next single star. That's going to be a breakout star and become the world champion or, someone he can build a company around, you know, a Undertaker or a Triple H or a Rock or a Stone Cold Steve Austin or a Rock or a Roman Reigns. That That is what Vince uh, covets. That is what he, you know, that's what he wants. That's what he's looking for always. Yeah. Well, also that night, Rikishi and Kane beat the Dudleys clean in a non-title match. <laughs> I just don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me. They are your champions, and you're beating them clean on the go-home show. To that's wrestle. very strange. Yeah, that's, that's very so, strange. I just don't get that. You guys do get a win later in the night, and then there's a little brouhaha with all three teams that sets up the ladder match. But my whole point of breezing through all that, setting us up for this watch along, is just I, no matter how many times you've explained it, and, and you have explained it, I do not understand and maybe it's a generational thing maybe now in wrestling we put more of an emphasis on the importance of wins but even as yeah, a storytelling oh, device this just seems like overkill to me yeah i i think we definitely do now but i i feel like vince is old he's old school he's kind of old-fashioned where in 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 his mind entertainment doesn't necessarily you know keep a character strong if it's a win or a loss it's like the context of the story the character's in like a win or loss is irrelevant as long as the story is good, you know, along his journey. I feel like that's kind of what his mindset is. Where I feel like now in this day, in this age, especially with AEW, because we promote such a sports-centric product where wins and losses matter, you know, even keeping records, having rankings and whatnot. So it's like a, a real deal. Obviously, in real sports, wins and losses matter. You know, that's that's determines if you become the world champion of the year you know if you win the super bowl or you win the world series or whatever it may be wins and losses matter with wrestling it's different to you know to a degree because it's entertainment and i feel like vince still believes more importantly that uh wins and losses are secondary to the storytelling and what the character is doing and, and also his motivation and whatnot well again i also think it kind of damages credibility as characters a little bit to have all those losses but Maybe that's just my take on it. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but but I also think too, John, as we've talked about in the past, I feel like you are more of a modern wrestling fan, and sure. I, I think I think they are really important in this day and age because people understand it's entertainment, but they also want uh, a sports centric type vibe to it, which means wins and losses have to matter because in sports, wins and losses matter, and if wrestling is going to uh, portray itself as a half ass sport, as long as entertainment, also wins and losses have to somewhat matter. What just bothers me, and this is the last point I'm going to make because I know we got to get to our watch along. The last point that I want to make is when you have all of these preconditioning of, oh, guys can lose and all that, it normalizes that. And it preconditions fans to think in a way that they can be numb to characters being set back by losses and then just not caring about that. And for me, that is not healthy for yeah. efficient long form storytelling. Agreed. So agreed. Just my thoughts on that. All right. So we promised you guys that we would have a very special guest on this week's edition of the extreme life of Matt Hardy. And we are now joined by him. None other than Christian Cage himself, a longtime hearty frenemy, as Matt said before. <laughs> How are you doing today, man? How's everything I'm doing, going? I'm doing good, but don't you know having me as a surprise is a big letdown? No, it's not. <laughs> this is the guy that made Edge and Christian. This is there the you guy. Go. 
That's what I like to hear. He, he was the secret sauce, John. Yeah, he, he was the secret sauce. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's <laughs> Christian Cage. That's, that's, the, term, that's the terminology I use all the Start time. In the merch. <laughs> um, so, Christian, what we've been talking about leading up to this match, this triangle ladder match, is how much you guys were so inconsistently booked leading up into this match. Oh. Each team was losing week in and week out yeah. leading up to this triple threat ladder match. I didn't even remember that. Like we got beat all the time. You guys got beat. I, Dallas got beat. I had no recollection of it either, yeah. but it's also, um, I guess par for the course at the yeah. time yeah. too, right? It was very much um, week to week at, the, at that point for us. And we were just trying yeah. to get our footing on that. And I think, don't think any of us were at the stage yet where we questioned a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We just kind of went with the flow. And I, I think once we, we knew that we had this match locked in, Regardless of what they did beforehand, we were going to steal the show. Yeah, and and I also told John, I think too, like Vince tag teams at that time, they weren't his priority. Yeah. We're like fine, and I think he's like, oh, these guys are Teflon. They'll go and have a great match, and everybody will forget yeah. about it. So that's kind of the position we're in. What did you make of this WrestleMania card? Uh, in in hindsight, looking back at it, Matt and I were talking the this card WrestleMania two thousand. There is one singles match on it. It is Terry right. versus the Cat in a cat fight. And every other match is either a multi-person match or a tag match in some capacity. So you guys are tasked with going out there and trying to steal the show. Do you guys remember uh, what you were thinking leading into that moment? I don't know. I, th I feel like this was kind of like the last of the WrestleMania in the arena type events, right? Was it not? Yeah. Or the the next year was in Houston at the Astrodome. Right. Yeah, yeah the next year was. It, it kind of got bigger after that. And then we went to the Sky Dome. Yeah. for 2002 yeah. right yeah. i mean it, so, it was the start of it for sure this right. was kind of like the last smaller arena big small but, arena uh, even though in, in as opposed the, to a stadium in, well in the pond in anaheim too at the time was kind of like our madison square garden of the west it was like we weren't running la consistently for for tv or pay-per-views it was always anaheim and um i remember it being a different feeling in that arena that night than it had been for any other event that we've done in there before it was electric it was um at least for our match, it felt like people were ready for that match and want, were excited for it and wanted to see it, especially after coming on the heels of, of what we did in the first ladder match when it was just Edge and Christian versus yeah. the Hardys. And, and this definitely predates uh, the Stable Center, right, being open. I mean, that, that it really was. This was yeah, our center there, have, right? It might have been open, but I don't know if we were necessarily running it at the time. I don't feel like we were. I, it might, like, might not have been open. When, whenever you say that it was our MSG of the West, right. I, I agree with that statement. Yeah. That was accurate. It was a big deal. Anaheim was always a loaded show. And this WrestleMania had a special energy to it, too. Mm. The Staples Center had uh, just opened, actually, the weekend of your No Mercy ladder match. Oh, wow. So it was a still a relatively new venue. You guys weren't running it yet. And I was going to ask about the crowd, but I'll get this watch along going here and, and get things started, and we'll talk about that. If any of you want to watch along with this match with us and want to watch on Peacock, is 5831 on Peacock. So go ahead, pause this, get your stuff set up. Uh Christian, I know you and Matt are seeing tons of royalties from Peacock. So, yeah. Hey, um, yeah. hey man, what, what about those royalties? Yeah. <laughs> Magic right there, my friend. So, uh, pull that thing up right now. It is the fourth match on this WrestleMania 2000 card, 58 31. And we're going to watch along here on Matt Hardy brand as well in five, four, three, two, one, begin. So we take it with the Hardys coming to the ring. Jeff, that's where he started going around a lot. First time ever. Yeah, I remember him doing that. I was like, oh boy. Here and, we go. and that became a thing yeah. after that. He had to do it every single yeah. time because he's a fucking maniac, yeah. <laughs> a psychopath, yeah. stuntman. I remember we were kind of in the like the bowels of the building here somewhere waiting to go out. And it was kind of like a, like there was like like skids that you, you stack things on and like, um, like little tractors and stuff. And we were just waiting. And I just remember like, I just had this this sensation of having like a really dry mouth. Oh, That's yeah. really vivid to me that I was like, I wasn't like nervous. I was more anxious to get out there and just get it started because, you know, like this was the first time we'd done this at this point. It was just the triple threat tag ladder match, right? It was yeah. like, um, there was not, this was before TLC. And and this was the first time we'd opened on the main card of Mania too. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, that's right. It really was, yeah. When you guys have the ladder match in your pocket. Matt and Jeff have the tables match from the Royal Rumble in the pocket. What are the expectations you set for yourself coming into this? I mean, they were high. Yeah. I mean, they were there. Every time we did one of these, the expectations were high. 
And it's funny because if you watch back from the first ladder match as they went along, you know, we learned how to incorporate more psychology into these type matches rather than just having a, a car crash and doing uh, big things with the ladders, not just for the sake of doing it. Of course, that's there. there's nothing like getting that crazy reaction when the fans see a car crash, but it's also you want it to be to make sense in, yeah. the, in the, the context of the match. Yeah, man, if you watch this match and then you go fast forward a year to TLC2, the psychology is so drastically better. Yeah, and we're it's, still learning at this point how, yeah, how to make totally. that happen in these types of matches. You know, we were still, I mean, we, we, were, we were paving new, new yeah. ground here. That's exactly the point I was going to make. It's not like you have anything to lean on. Here. Right. It's, it's no. interesting you brought that up because uh, I was going through some old observers doing research for this, and, and Dave Meltzer in particular mentioned that this came off as very much a stunt show in comparison to some of the other great matches that you guys put together, including the tables match, including the ladder match. Well, I mean, this is the first time we did the triple threat. So there was added two more bodies into there that you had to be, um, you know, figure into everything. So, and, you know, everybody has to be protected in their own way. And, um, you know, we honestly, at this point, up until about, I think maybe a few days before we actually sat down to put this together, we didn't even know what the finish was. Uh, at one yeah. point, it was somebody else winning, and Edge and Christian were splitting up after this. So um, then we kind of um, we started to, to to talk. Was it a little bit before this or after this when we kind of started talking, and then we we turned. Am um, I getting it all mixed up? Are we already we're already heels here, right? No, 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 this, I think you turned after this. Yeah. This, this was kind of like the catalyst that I think right. that ultimately turned you heel. And yeah. going into this, uh, which, which we recorded earlier in the podcast, was uh, you kind of screwed us out of some matches. Right. And we screwed you guys S building so to that this was, too. I was like, oh, so it was like leading up to when we had that. Did we already have that sit down interview like on Heat where we kind of just went off the cuff? They told us just to say whatever we wanted to. Yeah. And then Adam and I started dropping F bombs. And that kind <laughs> of, that, well, no, it was because that, because we weren't supposed to. We were supposed to lose, and that changed the minds. Um, they were like, "Oh, these guys aren't done yet. There's more layers to yeah, them as, yeah. as a tag." Team. And they then they decided to have us win the match and then turn heel um, because they saw some personality there when we were doing. We did that promo, and then we did a couple things on commentary, and um, that was kind of the uh, the thing that saved Edge and Christian as a team because we were going to split up after this. And and I, I totally. I mean, there's times where I can be critical of like decisions that WWE or Vince would make, whatever. And you guys winning this match was 100% the right call. And especially turning Hill because that like, I mean, that, that worked wonders for you. And, well, and, and you're totally right. I do remember they were ready to pull the trigger. Yeah. Try and get singles guys, whatever. But that, that interview pulled them back in. They said, Oh, we got way more we can do with these guys. Right. And they, and at this point too, you guys had all won the tag title tag titles and we hadn't won them yet. t Von Sale. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's so great. He's so great. Devon, he said, I'm going to hit my whole Hogan cell, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Shake, yeah. spasm. Yeah. And we're just trying to, you know, we're just doing some some signature stuff here, just trying to, you know, kind of build towards these these ladders. And, and you know, like I said, we kind of learned as we went here, as far as, you know, the main thing to never lose focus on is, is, the object of this match is to get what's hanging above it. Yeah. And yep. never lose sight of that. When you have a chance to wow. go get it, go get it. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense in the in the context psychology wise. If you're just totally. setting up everybody's on the floor, but you set up the ladder to jump on everybody on the floor, it doesn't yeah. make sense. Right. If everybody's on the floor, set up the ladder and try to win. That's and there the there, there are some instances in this where I see that where it's yeah. like, I wish yeah. we, you know, had, had changed yeah. that or, or we hadn't have done that or whatever, yeah. or just you know, uh positioned it differently. Right. You know, but the, yeah. Once again, we, we knew we had to provide a lot of entertaining spots and some big high spots in this, considering what we came off. Yeah, of. and like here, like I'm just standing there watching right. Bubba do a move. Uh, yeah, it's not to my partner, but like later on, yep. we probably would have staggered this and gave totally. it the, the the entire platform to themselves to do and we, that. And we would have fucked off outside. The yeah, ring. and then we would have. Here, Matt, this sucks. Them. Matt, you're under a ladder here. Watch this. Mm. Yeah, I I remember that and. uh that, that wasn't bad at all. No. The weight of the ladder and edge on top of that isn't that bad? Yeah, uh, Adam took good care of me. What is the what is the pain threshold for falling on a ladder? Like in comparison to a chair or a table, I think a lot of wrestling fans. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird because you, like, you hit something, you go, okay, that hurt. But your adrenaline is pumping. Like, you know, there's a lot of things going on in your mind. And also like the, the, the crowd reacting – you know, puts your, your adrenaline at a different level. So a lot of times something happens and you don't really think about it. And then you feel it like when you cool down, like you'll feel it an hour or two later, like, man, that hurt. And 
but when you're out there, you're just trying to, um, you know, get get through the match and, and put on the performance that you're that the crowd deserves. And, and two, it's it's one thing if you take a, a big bomb off something high and you land on the mat, you know, it's flat. And if you land flat, as we're supposed to do as trained pro wrestlers, uh, you know, it, it's you you optimize the the safeness of it. You know, whenever you land on a ladder, it is not flat and your body isn't hitting in an even yeah. capacity. So that that's dangerous. I mean, like taking bumps on ladders is it, dangerous yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. And it's funny thing is too, like if you climbed up the ladder to the top, during the day when the when the, or the night before whatever it was and the arena is empty it's terrifying it's scary <laughs> yeah. because it feels so high and like the, the arena is so empty and just seems so big and then when you're when you it's filled with people it, it's weird it just goes away it's, it feels like somehow closed in it's it's uh it's a strange feeling it's, it's strange to kind of explain to people so uh, adrenaline the power of adrenaline we asked a lot of our extreme life of matt hardy fans to send in some questions for this match and using hashtag Ask Matt and Brian wants to know, with this being the first WrestleMania for all of you, how much pressure did all of you put on yourself to steal the show? And were there any spots that you wanted to do but could not? Um, I don't think there was any, like, you know, nobody could put, put more pressure on us than we put on ourselves, right? Like, we, the goal was to go out there and steal the show. And we were, like, um, like you were talking about earlier, the lead up. And I just remember, like, you know, Ooh. just having things not really making Ooh. sense leading up. And I just remember that and we knew that these opportunities, if we didn't put on something special or something that people were going to talk about or remember, we weren't going to, going to get a chance to do it again. So, and like, we wanted to put tag team wrestling on the forefront of the, of the company. We wanted it to be must see. Yeah. We wanted it to be, no, we need these guys on the show every single week. That was our goal at this point in time was to get to that position where no, these guys, these three teams need to be on the show every single week. Going back to what we just watched there too. One of the dangerous things about these matches are the inanimate objects laying in different positions in the mm -hmm. ring. Like when that spear happened, that other ladder was laying behind yeah. them. You have to be very careful about where that stuff's position, hopefully try and keep it moving out of the way, especially if you're actively taking bumps in the ring. See, so, yeah, I mean, it, they, they were yeah. plenty far away, but if that ladder would have been a little further over, I mean, yeah. that would have been catastrophic. Yeah, I mean, that was a pretty spectacular spot there, but because of what you guys topped the year after, people talk about the other one, the other spear from Edge. Yeah, I mean, and, and once again, it was that was like elevating it. And I remember this spear is what we eventually elevated the, the spear off the ring to. And that, that all kind of built anyway, because you had him getting spear off the ladder, and then you had those guys hanging on the ring at SummerSlam in the first TLC, and then at WrestleMania in TLC 2, uh, Jeff was hanging from the ring, and he got speared by Adam. So that uh, that continued to build. And once again, that that that's us trying to, to raise the bar each time. You got Christian on the lap here. The dreaded butt punch. Yeah. <laughs> the ass punch from Butt Butt Ray. Yeah. I'll never forget the first time Road Dog came to a house show and he was wrestling. Yeah. And it had like Bubba yeah, Road. Yeah, butt butt. yeah. And the way <laughs> the H's yeah. were written, it was like through. And he said, Who the hell's Butt Butt? <laughs> Who's Butt Butt? <laughs> That's how Bub Bub B U H B U H looked. Oh, that cutter off the ladder. That crowd went nuts for that. Uh, what'd that feel like? That was a little jarring, but um, <laughs> You know, it's uh, as long as you you distribute your uh, weight evenly and land flat. It's it's, but it's gonna it's gonna jar you no matter what. Yeah. Is it hard for you guys to watch this back all these years later? It's not hard. No, no. I mean I see things that I wouldn't do that yeah. we're doing here that I would not even dream about doing now, or like, hey, this probably would have been better here, or, or you know, like I said, I look from a critical. Like, like, I, are you I, I, I see I see a lot of holes in my work for sure. That's you know, right. and I see a lot of, a lot of holes in like. Psychology in the match, too. Things that I would do differently, for sure. Here we go, Matt. Got to play the greatest hits. Yeah, look at everybody standing up. That's it, yeah. That's crazy. I mean, see, like, e e even even that, I would have tried to construct that in a different way where, like, uh, if the ladders were somehow in these positions and guys – Jeff just like throwing up. Yeah, no just hands. laying on his back. He didn't yeah. care. Uh, if we'd been in these ladders, I would have tried to, like, maybe have two guys trying to, like, throw us through – the guy on the table, but then we fight them off and then we turn and decide to jump yeah. as opposed to just being up there with everybody else down. Yeah. <clears throat> just once again, try and highlight and the like point like, of this is to get these titles. Yeah. Is that, was that, was that ladder still set up in the corner from the, from your jump? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And see like even Adam, you know, is bringing it over and I know you guys are going to superplex him, but just like if you would have kept t he could have just set it up I'm underneath up, the yeah. title and, and tried to win while yeah. you have d occupied. You know, it's little things like that in this match. I walk back and go, eh. or if like you know, Devon had 
climbed up there and I grabbed the ladder and pulled it backwards as he was on it while he was trying to grab it. And then, right. you know, Adam swung it around and we did something, you know, to that effect. Like, Now, not to excuse that, but also at the time you have to keep in context, these fans were so thirsty for this stunt show, car crash style stuff. So, you well, know, maybe I, now in hindsight, you're like, yeah, the psychology wasn't there as much, but. Well, I'll tell you what else is important for us is to not be just the guys that fall off things and mm -hmm. have to hit each other with ladders to get reactions. We wanted to, to be able to do these types of matches and have people enjoy them and look forward to them. But then we were doing rest, real, like, straight-up wrestling matches, whether they're singles or tags, being like, oh, I want to see these guys wrestle, right. but they're not falling off anything. Like, you want them to, to be engaged and entertained um, even when you're in a, a regular match. See, like this spot, I'm totally down for this. You have all four guys up at the top of the yeah. ladder trying to fight to get the titles, and we're underneath the titles where it's feasible you get them. And then we all bump off. Like, this is totally good. Yeah, that was very close to like my neck landing on the bottom rope and breaking it. <laughs> now here's Bubba the Lone Man standing. And uh, shit's about to get pretty crazy soon, as if it wasn't already. So it's going to be some pretty gnarly stuff. I think so, yeah. One involving you. I do, remember, do, you do you remember when we went out? I talked about it earlier. Bruce Bridge said, look, I know you guys are doing a lot of crazy things. Uh, don't rush. If you need to take extra time, oh. take a few extra minutes, whatever. We're fine on time. We're good. If you need okay. to take five extra minutes, that's fine. And just for someone to say that at WrestleMania is yeah. like unprecedented, especially right. in this day and age. See, like psychologically, I don't. why would you guys be setting up that ladder there? That's yeah. not underneath the... Well, it, what in hindsight, what I would have done is stayed <sighs> down until all these four guys were there, then dragged it over and climbed up. You know what I mean? Instead of doing it while another person just standing, uh, my opponent standing there right beside me. Like well, I've done that. Here, it, here it goes. Watch this, guys. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you and Jeff nailed that. How'd that feel, Christian? You and Jeff just catapulted all the way to the outside there. I don't know. It kind of became my specialty to go over the ropes, <laughs> all the way to the floor. I don't know. It's never been too difficult of a bump for me, so I was. It was. It was pretty good. It was pretty easy. All guys down here. Letting the crowd get up. Standing O. We want to ride out the standing O as long this, as possible. This is something good we did here. Just let everybody yeah, yeah. digest, get some shots of the car crash, the the, the bodies. We do remember. I remember we were like, Baba, you got up a little too soon. <laughs> I think we, we could have milked that a little longer. Yeah. But also, like I said, this one being the first one of these. Yeah, like, totally. threat ones. Totally. You know. uh, Richie wants to know. Go We're ahead. also trying to position these guys as hills too, so I think that was sure. that was that was the deal. Uh, Richie wants to know how did the veterans react to this match? Was it positive, or did they think some of this was unnecessary? Um, I mean, I think they were they realized what it was, and a lot of the comments were, "Well, better you guys than us." Like they wouldn't want to, do it, you know? <laughs> right? And but for the most part, it was very very positive stuff, and like they realized that that the risks we were taking and. and how we were putting our bodies on the line and they respected that uh, what, for you know what we were doing. Yeah, that uh, that that's what I would have said as well. That, that wraps it up. Well, it's the Dudleys, so we need some wood. Here we go. And this really was. This was our first introduction of tables, which I'm glad we waited on them to do it first. I do remember when we started, when we were getting the reactions, that there were some people that didn't want to follow these matches. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so do, I do remember that. There was, um, there was, so there was a lot of always like – indecision as far as where we would be on the card because of um, matches that we're having to follow it. Yeah. I mean, I feel bad for you guys that you had to set the table for uh, Terry and cat to come after you, you know, that was, uh, to, well, we, 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 we hope we made them proud. <laughs> we hope we, we get the crowd primed and ready. Val Venus was the special guest referee in that. So <laughs> take something away from that there. Um, Is this setting up the bridge. Yeah. Uh, Tyler asks, do you feel like this match is often overlooked because of the TLC matches that followed? No, I think it's, yeah. I, I mean, I think it is what it is. I, I, I think for my, my personal opinion is the one that we did the next year in Houston was the best. Yes. Yeah. Same. Um, and, uh, and also TLC at SummerSlam was, was better than yeah. this too. Yeah. I think if anything, people talk about how great this match was as the first one and not to like undersell us, but this, it, if anything, it's a little overrated. 
yeah, if possible. You know, if, if that makes sense, just from a psychology standpoint, I think we could have done. Yeah, it's also not a TLC match, so yeah, it's it's, 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 it's not really, a TLC match, right? I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's like it was never billed as that. It was the triangle ladder match, so it's. Uh, um, but this was like this was the kind of the what would it eventually be without this, this, the, without the this match without this match it wouldn't have, it would have, wouldn't have turned into the TLC right no because it kind of gave us all our own thing you know the Dudleys of the tables you guys had ladders we had the chairs when we introduced the concerto yeah and just became that thing that, that Mick Foley coined when he was the the, um, the GM and he yeah the TLC all my. Uh, is this contraption here with the table on the ladder? Is that a Michael Hayes suggestion by chance? I think that was that was us. That was us. All you guys. That, that was us. Yeah, I, I remember saying that, and I, I do remember we had the people who gimmick tables. We had them reinforce that table on top. Yeah, because we knew ultimately the finish was going to come down with um, me, him, and Adam on it, and you know I was going to get bumped off, and we just thought a regular table might fall. So this was also a, a so different table. A, didn't you get to take a crazy power bump through a table? I did, yeah. What's oh, happening right now? Yeah, it's happening very short. There's yes. a couple big yep. table bumps for you. This match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember whenever I was just like, I think I can do this. And I remember it was so unsteady because yeah. these ladders are ladders are ladder. Anybody yeah. who's ever climbed up a ladder think, knows you, how you feel if you start getting to the top. Once, <laughs> once they're getting pulled on and thrown and pushed, like they bend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're not even even a lot of times. You get on it, there's like they're wobbling. And so you don't even know when you get to the top of it how stable it's going to be. It's kind of, you know, unnerving a little bit. Uh, Joseph wants to know, at this point in time, as you're having this match, are you thinking, well, there's no way we can top that? Or is the goal, as Matt goes through a table there, is the goal to top this every time you go out? Yeah, I think we yeah. just wanted it to, to – I think we understood the match a little better after every time we did it. Yeah. So we didn't necessarily feel the need to to – beat it stunt wise we wanted it to just be a better match all around and make as much sense um like psychology wise we wanted to start incorporating psychology into these matches like i said instead of just being car crashes and bumps for the sake of taking bumps and throwing ladders for the sake of throwing ladders so um that's what i think about it. i don't know. I, I think too i think as as time went on uh we wanted to improve the quality of the match right. so if a viewer is watching it not only are they like excited to see all the crazy spots that happen, but also excited for the characters in the match because they're emotionally invested in them. So I, I got to admit too, I think as time went on at the end, we tried to always incorporate bigger, like Holy shit moments, whatever it may be. You a, know, a lot of the times what would happen is we would come in with um, ideas as far as structuring the match. And Jeff was net, that was never Jeff's <laughs> bag. You know, okay. Jeff was, was going to come up with the one stunt that was yep. going to be the holy shit moment of the match. And he was like, he, that was his vision. And then our job was to, okay, how do we figure Jeff's spot and how do we incorporate it and, and get it to the, the spot where it's going to be the most effective. That's it. Seeing the setup for that right now. Like this was Jeff's thing that he wanted to do. So we're trying to figure, we tried to figure out here how to. Yes. Yeah. Well, and Matt, it's a nice call back to the rumble 2000 match too, where, you know, Jeff did the big swanton through a table. Yeah. Now we're calling back to that only a few months later. Yes. Yeah. We're going to see something similar here. In one of the other matches, Jeff, we call it the Frogger spot, where Jeff like hopped <laughs> from ladder to ladder. And he did it four or five times during the day or the night before and nailed it every time. But like we said, when you get out there and the ladders are a little bent, they're not quite the same as they were fresh. Not quite as stable. He hit one and it kind of wobbled. And I, I remember hearing him. Be mad at it, like oh, because he was, he was so mad, and he was That's, very always in check with his emotions out there. He was very rare you ever heard any like emotion from Jeff as far as being mad or like you knew something wasn't right, because um, he's paired it pretty even tempered that way. But you could tell that pissed him off. That that's when uh, he goes from the top of one ladder to the other, where he like walks yeah. the top of the fan. That was the uh, Mania Seventeen. That was right before the spear yeah. spot because that was supposed to set that up. Um, but I don't think anybody cared. It ended yeah, up like to me. This 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 made sense here, where I tried yeah. to cut him off. And oh, that was great. That and With the bell, Jeff just on. whipped you into the barricade. And here we go. The stunt man. Okay, well, I remember even thinking too, like, oh, that's a little close yeah. <laughs> for how, how tall the ladder was. I mean, it was either a twelve or fourteen foot ladder. I'm not sure which one it is, but I I, I do know after Jeff does this when he hits him 
It's a very soft swanton. Like, he ends up taking care of it. But, like, Jeff didn't think, think he broke the table at first. But the ball of his foot was out after this, and he had to get put back in place. Yeah, he, oh, had wow. bruises, he had bruises on the back of his legs Ooh. up to from his ankles up to his knees on the back of his legs from slamming it on the concrete here. You can see how hard he hit right there. Well, it still is one of those great, iconic WrestleMania camera shots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right head on the ground. And it's one of those, you see that this moment right here replayed and that's what it is it's it's all about is capturing moments yeah and um this is one of those ones that you always see and that, i mean that's one of those things we always worked hard to incorporate into a match for jeff is just like a moment because he really is like being who he is and the way the way he's wired he just he's a moment maker you know stuff like this stuff like the spear with adam whatever it may be hanging on the uh the rings when he kicked Devon down, you know, they're, they're, we're always looking for a moment and Jeff would kind of give us that moment. And then it was the job of the architects of the match to kind of incorporate yeah. it. So here we go. Starting to get the gears turning towards the finish. Yeah. Devon going up. We know Devon hates heights. So I'm sure he didn't love. Yeah. No, he's a trooper in these Cause he was terrified of heights. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like I said, day before with no crowd, you it's hard to get him to go up any of these ladders. Like he was just, just terrified. But once like I said, once the crowd was there, he was, he got up there. You could hear him talking to himself, but he, he did it. You know? Yeah. Gotta go. Gotta go. Yeah. Go. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Yeah. He was you go. terrified of heights. Dragging yourself up. Matt, you've talked about that, that on past episodes. Yeah. If you go through war, you try to drag yourself up that ladder. Yeah. When you lose your legs, man. And we talked about the before also with the ladders. Like the, the ladder that on the side that I'm on, the one um, leg was really bent. And it was – so it was basically on three legs here. It was really wobbling. So I was like – in my head, I was like, I just see this thing tilting over and this finish getting completely messed up. In my head, I just – he's there. Yeah. Ugh. That table like disintegrated. Yeah. And like I couldn't stand up here because this was wobbling so bad. Like, I thought if I stood up, that we both would have gone ass over TK. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see me. I start rolling. And I'm yeah. like, when I'm not sure if it's going to go, I was yeah. ready to roll my ass out of the ring. And there it is. This is a big moment for us. Like, yeah. like we, had, we had played this moment over in our heads since we were kids in, in my side yard, you know, talking that we were going to be tag team champions someday. And, like, this was the moment that we had, we had dreamed about and talked about since we were kids. And um, to be able to share it with, with, with Adam on the top of this ladder was, was pretty awesome, pretty special. And obviously, you know, with these guys too, we had a really special moment backstage after, um, which we always did, made it a point to do after these matches is just find a place where we could just be alone and reflect. And, um, you know, we're putting lives, our lives in each other's hands. And there's, yeah. a, there's a certain level of respect that goes with that. And then uh, once again, I just want to reiterate, that was totally the right call too. You you, you guys winning this match was, was an great absolute shot. right call. That was a super great shot. That started back at No Mercy, yeah. the overhead cam and became famous. For our, yeah. our crazy bumps, they called the Wiley Coyote Cam. So they're called yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah, it was the Wiley Coyote Cam. Man, that was uh, that was great. So watching it back, I mean, how do you feel about it all these years later? Yeah, I mean, I still feel good about it. Like yep. I said, it was kind of the it was set the stage for what the match would ultimately become, which was the TLC match, and and um, like I said, that was kind of like the the springboard into these triple threat and multi man uh, type ladder matches, and and. You know, I'm happy with it. I think it holds up the test of time, and you can also see where we got better mm -hmm. uh, with with these matches, as far as piecing them together and, and adding psychology, which is super important. Agreed. I mean, I, I think for six guys who were making their WrestleMania debut in a match that had a ton of pressure on it, yeah. and we had to go out and like pull off some pretty important shit, and you know, there was a whole lot of stunts, there was a whole lot of uh, uh, room for error and whatnot. I, I, th I thought we killed it. I thought yeah. we did really good. Yeah, I and and we get we gave the crowd moments that they would remember for the rest of their life. You yeah. know, and 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 it worked. Looking back, could it have been better? Yeah, but it was like our starting point, and it really set the foundation for the whole TLC moment. Yeah, and I think we were, we were so young and hungry too that we just we realized the opportunity that was in front of us as far as making a statement. Yes, and um, like I said, I think all all three teams. It was like you know we had lightning in a bottle when it was Edge and Christian and the Hardys, and then when the Dudleys came along, it just added that like dangerous element that our teams were lacking. You know, mm -hmm. they, were, they were bigger, they were dangerous, mm -hmm. they were they were like that brought that tough kind of more street fight element to like our finesse, I guess at the time. Yeah, and um, it just it just gelled and it worked. And I think we all were of the same mindset. Like we wanted to put tag team wrestling back on the map. We wanted it to be an important part of the show. And um, we wanted it to be a springboard to, um, to launching all of our careers. Like and Matt said this from the very first edge and Christian versus the, the 
uh, Hardy Boys ladder match. Matt said it best. He said um, it took us from being WWE wrestlers to WWE superstars overnight, and um, we we're on our way here. You guys get four stars from the Observer for that one, Matt. Not five, but four. Uh, still pretty good. It's the highest rated match of the night. It's considered by the readers the best match of the night, and it certainly got the biggest reactions of the night on what I said before. Not a very good WrestleMania. Uh, all things considered, uh, I got one more question for you guys from our fans here again. Hashtag Ask Matt. Brad wants to know after doing a ladder match like this, your bodies obviously suffer. So now it's 2022. You're both still at it. What is your secret? This is a good way to help educate the younger generation of wrestlers who are out there, the Darby Allens, those types that are out there throwing their body everywhere. How do you keep your bodies healthy all these years later after a car crash like that? I mean, part of it's luck. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but also part of it is, is like I said, you know, learning to, to do, not just doing it, um, just throwing it out there just to do it. So like I said, launching yourself off of um, the top rope and taking a, a straight back bump on the floor becomes like an arm drag. You don't want it to be that right. like, like you have to, now you have to go bigger than that to get reactions. You know, you want people to be invested in you as a wrestler, as a character, and not necessarily just because you, you know, fling your body anywhere. So the, 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 the the goal is to have people feel that connection with 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 you. So when you do those things, when you pick your spot with those things, they mean more. You don't have to do them on a nightly basis where you're going to kill your body. And I think these guys even had a head start on us because they were like officially trained at a wrestling school. Jeff and I we're backyarders and shit. You know, like uh, <laughs> learning how to learning how to work smarter as yeah. opposed to you know like you can you can work really hard, but you can also work smart. You don't need to be reckless and take like yeah. unnecessary chances and unnecessary bumps. And just uh, as 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 I've gotten, as I've gotten older, speaking for myself, Jeff's still a stunt man. You know, I just, I really pick and choose when, when I do things. And I, I just do a good job of taking care of myself. And as he said, too, obviously luck is a huge factor in it because we're just lucky that we, we are as healthy as we are at this stage of the game with all the insane things we've done. You know, there's a saying, motion is lotion. So, like, if you're, you know, as long as you're, you're taking care of your body, you're working out, you're trying to feed yourself properly, um, you know, that also goes a long way as far as, as longevity. You know, and I think that when um, even though when I was retired for seven years, yeah, I wasn't as strict. And obviously when I was getting ready to come back, you know, I really dialed it in. But I still like worked out and and, you know, tried to eat as, as clean as possible, even if, you know, I was, you know, not like I said, not quite as strict as, as I was when I was competing. But I think that's that's key is just yeah. taking care of your trying to take care of your body. I feel like if you live this lifestyle and, and you you realize the damage you've done to your body by taking all these bumps, I, that becomes like a thing. Like I will always you know, stretch and work out and yeah. do whatever just to take care of myself because I want to also optimize the state of my quality of life. Yeah. It's crazy. I'm just, I'm super weird with this kind of stuff, but like I never stretch and I had never stretched before matches. I'd go in cold. I never warm up. I never <laughs> stretch. I just go. And that's just my thing. I don't yeah. know why. That's awesome. That's, it's like, it's very weird. You and Fit Finley? Fit like that too? Yeah. Fit, oh. Fit would do that. When I was working with Fit there, uh, we worked together on it for a long time. He'd sit down and say, oh, you good fit? And he said, yeah, I'm good. I'm just stretching. <laughs> That's what and you're sitting before you got for the match. I'm good. I'm just stretching. Um, man, that was so much fun to get a chance to watch that back with you, Christian. It's, it's great to see you doing your thing. You and Adam Cole uh, tore the house down oh, just last week. It, it's really great. Did you ever envision that you and Matt Hardy would be working together all these years later, still in ring capacity? No, I mean, got to pinch myself sometimes. You know, yeah. that it's that, that, that getting this back is a gift for me. And after like it seemingly being gone for as long as it was, um, so I'm just trying to to um, uh, just take everything in as much as I can now, um, knowing that like it's not going to last forever. I know that it was taken away once, and at some point it's going to go again. So just got to enjoy the time that I do have. And um, it's just at this point, my only concern is putting on quality matches and, and enjoying myself, and um, you know, just giving giving back to the to the AEW fans that um, are so passionate and, and come out to support us every night. So. I, I I gotta say this too. I'm gonna add it. You know, like whenever you did that and you showed up at the Royal Rumble and you came out with that man, I was so happy. It's like one of the like as a, as a friend, one of my proudest moments. Oh, I thanks, think, man. oh man, it's so cool that you know that he has healed and he's healthy enough to go do this again. Because like once again, one of the most passionate guys you know that you'll ever meet, and one of the smartest guys. Like his mind for like wrestling and just psychology and just the entire business is is so underrated, and he never got the credit he deserves. So. Whenever he got that opportunity to come out, Royal Rumble was such a, a great emotional moment. And then once he came to AEW, I was so happy because I knew he would kind of get to, to write his last chapter on his own, and he would make it as good as possible. Yeah, it's always like humbling when when people come up and say, "Hey, you know, you're so underrated," and this and that. And my response is, "I'd rather be underrated than overrated." So <laughs> that's a good response. How valuable has he been to that locker room there, Matt? 
extremely valuable. I mean, you, you can tell like Papa Khan does a good job at putting guys who uh, have had some street cred and been around for a while with younger guys. And like just him working with Jungle Boy has been massive for him and Luchasaurus, I think, you know, and I, I think those guys are, ha, have learned and they have uh, they have also uh, just grown so much during the time they spent with him. Awesome stuff, man. We really appreciate, you know, Edge and Christian are so embedded in this story that is the career of the Hardy Boys. Yeah, and yeah. we're always going to be intertwined yeah. forever, you know. And it's you like, will fight you, forever. You can't talk about one without the other, you know. Yeah. So it's like, Very you know, true. we'll probably be at an autograph signing somewhere when we're 75. And I can't wait. Start up <laughs> angle or something. <laughs> and it's just so awesome because, like, you started out as friends, then you're feuding, then you're friends again, then you're feuding, and yeah. it goes on. We can't figure it out. It goes on and on for years, and we have many more TLC matches and big moments to yeah. cover here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy between you guys. So you have an open invite whenever you'd like to hop on and chat with us. Sure. Thanks, for having me. Thanks for asking. Really Happy it again. It. Absolutely. Uh, Matt Hardy, anything else you'd like to add here? I always tell people, check out the House Hardy on Twitch. Rebby Hardy up to some good stuff. Uh, what else is cooking over there? Uh, just killing it. You know, we're going to work right now, AEW. Uh, make sure to check out Dynamite every Wednesday. Make sure to check out Rampage every Friday. AW is doing some really good things uh, in 2022 and excited for it. And also, uh, I just want to say to Christian, people talk about how great of a shape he is in. He is in amazing and great shape. He, uh, you got some workout gear coming out, right? Yeah, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but yeah, we've got some some cool things on the horizon. Yeah. All right, I, I want to do that. I want to give a plug for his yeah. thing. He's got some some special stuff coming out that's really cool. Yeah, very and nice. It's very, it's very inspiring how great of a shape he's gotten himself into. Very nice. Well, keep your eyes open for that. Awesome. Really, look at that shit. Damn. You know what I mean? All right. Well, 48 uh, and turn it, he's 48 and turn into a sex spot. I've got a little uh, of whiskey here that I'm just going to go take some sips of after this. And uh, really appreciate you hopping on, man. And really appreciate all you guys as always listening to the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. Make sure you subscribe. Leave that five star review. And uh, we got a fun one next week. At least it'll be fun for me to hear your perspective. Not a fun topic, but uh, it's, we're talking about when Jeff was let go in 2003 and Matt Hardy, for the first time in his career, is on his own having to reinvent. So uh, I'm excited to take a peek inside that locked room that is your mind on that one, Matt Hardy. That's when I developed a little attitude. That's why it's going to be fun. We'll see you guys next week here on The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. Talk to you next time. Delicious!